are happening at this stage. So please give a warm welcome to our speakers, Mukulika Banerjee, Ravi Venkateshan, and they'll be in conversation with Dipankar Gupta. A big hand. Welcome, welcome. So as they take their seats and get strung up, let me introduce our speakers. On your far, on your far right is Mukulika Banerjee. She's an associate professor in social anthropology at the London School of Economics. And she's the first director of the South Asia Center to be launched at LSE in January 2014. Her new book, Why India Votes, was published by Routledge last year. In the middle is our moderator, Dipankar Gupta. He's currently a distinguished professor at Shiv Nadar University. He's also the director of the Reserve Bank of India and the National Bank for Rural Development. He's got numerous um, books to his name, edited several. Uh, most recently, Revolution from Above, India's Future and the Citizen Elite. And finally, on your far left is Ravi Venkateshan, former chairman of Microsoft India and currently chairman of the Social Venture Partners India. His uh, recently released and critically acclaimed book is Conquering the Chaos, Win in India, Win Everywhere, which I always think is a good point. <laughs> yeah. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, over to Dipankar. And he's very kindly, all the speakers have very kindly said that they would rather open it up to questions earlier to engage with you more. So they look forward to a discussion with you. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you. And thank you all for coming. Uh, the afternoon session is always a little difficult, post prandial effect. But we are very lucky to have Ravi Benkitesan and Mokulika here. You've, you know Mokulika, you've, you've, you've encountered on several occasions, but Ravi is rather new to this, and we are very keen to hear your views on the subject. Uh, it's growth and development, but uh, the way we have uh, framed it is not growth versus development, but how does growth and development work together? synergize and actually enforce, reinforce each other. As he uh, comes from the corporate world and she's from the academic world, I think we have a perfect match out here. And I'll begin with Ravi first because uh, you've written on the subject and you uh, see this issue from a corporate point of view. What do you think uh, is the role of the corporate enterprises in this relationship between growth and development? Because obviously it is not growth versus development, with growth and development going together, you can't have one but the other. And how does the corporate world see all of this? Great question. Uh, you know, when, when I first got the uh, description of the panel, it worried me because it did position it as growth versus development and the contradiction. And I think although you've clarified that these two are really not at odds with each other, it's worth uh, spending <coughs> a few more seconds on that. Uh, I think the, anybody who thinks that growth and development can't coexist and don't in fact reinforce each other truly um, or, you know, ought to rethink it. I was uh, talking with, to a gentleman this morning who used to head McKinsey. He gave me a very interesting statistic. McKinsey looked at uh, India's economic performance from 2005 to 2012 and they said in this period 139 million people had been t lifted out of poverty. And 75% of that actually happened just because of growth. And 25% was because of policies that you know, did uh, redistribution and so forth. So that's a very, very powerful idea. And, uh, and the only other analogy I'd like to make is, you know, right up to about 1990, people used to think. Well, if you don't mind, may I just stop you for a minute here? Yes. Uh, you mentioned the McKinsey study. I'd like to place another study for your consideration done by the Indian Human Development Institute. And they say that over the last four or five decades, while we've had growth, then certain things are very worrying. For example, the way the literacy, for example, you know, you have people who are nominally literate, but cannot actually, you know, read, a class eight student cannot read what class five students are supposed to read. On the health front, again, we know that lots of people go into poverty simply because they cannot pay the bills. And this, these issues have yet to be addressed Correct. while we talk about poverty and so forth. Absolutely right. I think in any number of social uh, indicators, 
you know, uh, we really are in a deplorable state. Even more worrying is, you know, the, you know, we pride ourselves on the rule of law. And we often say one of the things that's m m most different uh, about China and us is the rule of law. And, you know, it's becoming really questionable whether such, uh, this rule of law really exists in our country. So growth alone is not enough, but growth is essential if you are to have development. But you also need sensible policies and most of all important institutions that work institutions such as administration. So I'm not taking away from that, but without growth, you really don't have a whole lot going. And where I was, the point I was about to make is, you know, the issue of quality, right up till 1990, we, many of us used to think, you can have good quality, or you can have something that's low cost. You can't have good quality and low cost. And then of course the Japanese came in, companies like Toyota, and said, no, if you actually eliminate waste, you can, there's no reason why you can't have something that's really high quality and inexpensive as well. So the trick is, can you find the right model, which in our case is about the right policies and the right institutions. Now, coming back to the role of the corporate sector, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an academic and uh, I'm, I'm, all I've done is build businesses. No, aren't you lucky? Sorry? <laughs> what is that? Aren't you lucky? lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my experience is very practical, but I think the corporate sector does play an enormously important role in, not just in growth, but in development as well. And there is an important responsibility that companies have if you're going to build sustainable businesses. And I'll give you a couple of examples from my own personal thing. You know, in the, uh, I, I actually came from a company called Cummins, which used to build these, or still builds diesel engines. And the company is headquartered in Pune. And we had this enormous pressure in the company for, uh, globally that we should have more women in our workplace. And uh, in India, women don't, didn't, at least in the 90s, didn't want to study engineering. And if they did, they wanted to work at Infosys, not on the factory floor of Cummins. So we were always just dead last in our gender numbers. So finally, in desperation, what we did was opened a college of, for uh, women in Pune. It's called the Cummins College of Engineering for Women. And suddenly we had this pool of uh, people we could uh, draw from. That turned out to be the best investment that we ever made because it was fantastic for reputation. It was fantastic for uh, you know, changing the composition of our workforce, etc. So we approached it not as CSR, but actually solving a real business problem. Different example, I don't know if I'm we're okay on time. But when I joined Microsoft, I was really concerned by how much the company was disliked in 2004, and I said, this is really puzzling because it's a great company, everybody wants to work for it, why don't people like it? Well, the reason for this dislike was simple. Here's you know, the company that's so successful, but all we do is repatriate profits. It's owned by the world's most, no, the wealthiest man, and yet we don't do enough for the poor people in this country. And so there is this implicit sense that if you, are going to be successful, and particularly as a foreign company, if you're going to come to India, you have a certain social responsibility. So we scratched our heads and said, what do we do? Well, we said one of the things we can do is actually focus on computer literacy. So we partnered with a number of states, 14 states, and set up these computer literacy programs to teach people how to use Windows, Office, etc., in local languages. And over time, 35 million children had been trained. This is an audited number turned out to be fantastic again. It turned out that, you know, lots of people started growing up knowing how to use Windows, which is no bad thing. Secondly, it was fantastic for reputation. And then we started driving innovation out of this. So what started out grudgingly as, you know, the responsibility of a corporation actually ended up being incredibly smart business. So I began to realize good, you know, doing well and doing good are not contradictory. They actually reinforce each other. So for instance, if you're Infosys, it's getting harder and harder to hire good engineers because you're now going to smaller and smaller colleges. So what do you do? You set up a training institute and train people for six months before they're allowed to write a single line of code. This is not corporate social responsibility, mm. but you're actually doing a fantastic amount of good for, for the country. So I think every company, uh, if it begins to think about its business in an enlightened, self-interested way, think about the long-term sustainability, can actually do a great deal of good on the development angle as well, not just growth. Well, thank you very much.
I will come back to some of the issues later. But uh, Mukulika, what do you think? I mean, when you look at this whole business from the voters' point of view, from their perspective, from the arm army perspective, you might. How do they look at this issue of growth and development? How do they understand, you know, uh, enterprise doing well and people not doing so well, or the disparities not being bridged? And it's been 60 years. Yeah, uh, you know, as you know, uh, I teach at the London School of Economics. Uh, uh, some of my best friends are economists. Um, I do, um, and you read the international press, you read the national press. And when you need a reality check from what is reported about India, the macro picture, you really need to stop, uh, you know, take into account a completely different point of view, which pretty much is the everyday lives of most Indians. And I get my reality check from my research village in West Bengal, uh, where I've been returning to for 15 years. And just charting some of the big issues that we think are national news and talking to people in that place. They're a perfectly good sample. They're representative of uh, a number of other uh, Indians like themselves uh, to ask if, um, you know, when Cargill happened, whatever, there was a war, we thought this was going to affect the election. You just have to get out and talk to some people like that and say, do you think Cargill is going to determine the election? And they say, what's Cargill? You know, so India's growth rates is one of those kinds of figures. And I, it's very interesting when India's supremacy was unquestioned. You know, remember a few years ago when we didn't have a debate about, like we did in, in Chalbag in the morning, uh, who's going to rule the world? We were kind of, India was in the ascendant. Is India going to be the next superpower was the kind of question. And our growth rates were very high and touted. You really need to see what that does translating to the ground level. And that's the question you're asking. So there seems to be two aspects to how growth can be determined. And one are in these abstract percentage points, which very, very few people, a species called economists, understand. The rest of the people, it is whether uh, anything has materially changed in their environment. Um, and how it changes is usually what, again, in abstract terms, we call development. But really, when you talk to people, one of the ways they, they talk about it, of course, is, is bamba kamba. You know, it's about water and electricity. At the end of the day, is there water and electricity? It is when, again, when you chart India's development indicators, and we all know this, uh, with India's growth rates, the correlation that we would politically like to see happen hasn't happened. And it seems to me now, you know, when we talk about the terms of discourse now, is the Ahmad Admi in greater prominence? What seems to have shifted to me in political discussion is that this is no longer a choice. This is no longer a debate within, um, you know, the Aam Admi is being, our party is being called, are you a socialist party? And, they, and they're very clear, uh, certainly your danger has been very clear, saying, you know, I think that debate about are you going to have a social conscious, are you going to have social responsibility in the development agenda, or are you going to have a capitalist economy, is not no longer an either or question. Clearly the two things have to go together, and this is a debate that has been had over and over again. So at the end of the day, India's growth rates mean almost nothing to the Aam Admi, unless there is a material change. But this is exactly the period also when we have seen rapid urbanization. The bunker, you've written about this extensively. And in the rapid urbanization, the complete dismantling and, and, and uh, paucity of infrastructure, where half Delhi's population doesn't get a regular supply of water, forget any other urban areas. What kind of reality is this and how on earth does it make a difference whether India's growth rates are doing well or not is the question that most people will ask. Can I? Well, what's in it for, uh, just, just before you get, just yeah. in, what's in it for business to, to make sure that there's social development? How do you think business, a corporate world would, would react to the suggestion that they should also invest in this, not just in terms of their own enterprises, yeah. but also politically, also at the popular level, also to influence decisions? I want to come to that, but I really want to pick up on your point, Mukulika, with you. See, I used to also think this is an Aam Admi problem. Okay, Aam Admi doesn't get bijli, pani, sadak nahi hai, vagera, vagera, but you know, my life is okay. What I've begun to realize in the last two years is even if you are part of the elite, this stuff doesn't just stay there. It's now coming to the point and it's touching every one of our lives in a very practical way. See, uh, I have a very, you know, ancestral home in one city. 
and since I don't live in that city, I gave it out on rent. Now, the chap who moved in in May of 2012 start, decided to stop paying rent in, by September. So I said, no problem, we have a leave and license agreement, we cancel it. He refused to move out, he didn't pay rent. So no problem, you, if I, you take it to the small co causes court. For 12 months, the hearing has been postponed. Okay, so there's no, the judicial system is not going to go. So I decided, okay, let me go talk to the police commissioner. I went and talked to the chief minister of the state. Because we know all these people, they're helpless. They said, you asked, why did you go to the judicial system? You should have produced, uh, you know, gone outside that. So my point is what? I, it is not, no longer just an Aam Aadmi issue. The fact that the, the systems, administrative, judicial, law and order, aren't working even for the elite people like us, says we ought to be seriously concerned about the kind of country we are living in. We'll come to that later. Well, that's probably one of the reasons why the Ahmadi Party support structure cuts across classes and uh, communities. Correct. Anyway, let's go to the so other one. Back to uh, the uh, issue of what's in it for, co for companies. So I wrote this book uh, last year called Conquering the Chaos. And the subtitle, as he said, was if you can succeed in India, you can succeed anywhere. Because guess what? Most emerging markets, Nigeria, Indonesia, and all, they look just like us. They have the same corruption, the same lack of infrastructure, and so forth. At least India has a big market, and so on and so forth. And then I was in New York, <clears throat> and the ambassador, Frank Wisner, uh, I, who was on the panel with me, he says, Ravi, I think your book is good, and I largely agree with the advice. But what, you know, multinational companies, they have a choice. If India gets too chaotic, they'll pick up their bags and go to another country. What about you Indians? Where are you going to go? At what point will the chaos engulf India? So this is the issue for Indian businesses. The point is, how long will the growth story continue? How long can you prosper when in an environment which no longer works? You know, India is may be the hardest market in the world for any company, Indian or foreign, to do business in. I was sharing with, the, uh, with you, Dipankar, some of the statistics. You know, World Bank every year ranks countries based on how easy they are to do business. India is number 134 out of 200, and we are behind, guess which countries? We're behind Pakistan and Yemen, okay? In terms of ease of starting a business, we're number 186. In terms of paying taxes and difficulty and complexity, number 158. So the point is, it is beginning to choke and suffocate all activities. And so if you're a company, out, out of your own interest, you better take a, you know, a, a view of the ecosystem in which you're embedded. How, how long can you succeed if, you're, if the, your, uh, you know, the employees are unemployable, if the laws don't work? If, the, if you have such severe headwinds to doing the most mundane of tasks, for all these reasons, I think companies have to now, you know, take a much broader uh, view, which includes who's in power and uh, what sort of a society we're creating. Can I just come back on on one? Of, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, when you, uh, it, I think what you've just said raises the question of what businesses find easy to do business are a very different set of imperatives to necessarily to good governance. Right? What the imperatives of an elected responsible government and the imperatives of a business trying to set up in India surely must be very different. And I thought, okay, Dipankar in his book has highlighted four key areas which should be our priorities. And we talked about this last afternoon if you were here, universal health, universal education, formalization of labor, strict policy of urbanization. Now, can we just take that issue of labor? When a business is trying to set up in India, does it have any responsibility towards formalizing labor arrangements? Is this in the business interest, or is this something that, um, where in fact, you know, whether you're going to allow union activity, are you going to allow negotiation of any sort, or are you going to rely, in fact, as uh, is much more convenient uh, with an informal labor force, as is the case at the moment. I think that this, this argument of what's good for business, what's good for society can be bridged if you take the longer term interest. I think in your very book, you talk about Maruti Udyok 
at some point if you go too far the outsourcing subcontracting way, there is a backlash which is pretty ugly. So I think these things are not mutually exclusive. One of the most important things, whether you're an individual or a business, is contracts, okay? If you enter into contracts, do they, are they legally enforceable or not? So for an Aam Admi, this translates into, is there justice? If there is injustice, can I go to a court? Will I get some, do I have some recourse? It's the same for a, for a company. In India, again on that same list, is number 186 out of 200 in terms of enforceability of its legal contracts. I think these are two sides of the same coin. They manifest differently, <clears throat> but they're deeply problematic and they go back to governance, I would argue. Yeah, that's right. When you talk about contracts, uh, it's also interesting that when uh, business people discuss difficulties in doing business in our country, they usually refer to the government's ineptitude in upholding law and order and stuff like that. And also, yes, the numbers of uh, uh, forms you have to fill and clearances you must get. But I rarely have hear from them that, you know, we should have a different way of employing labor. Yes. True. I really, really yes. rarely hear from them that we should spend more yeah. money on R&D. Uh, Infosys, which is uh, a leading company here, and I think if there's anybody from Infosys, they'll bear me out that in IT industry, which is a very high research content industry, India spends, by planning commission figures, barely 3% of its, uh, uh, of its um, uh, turnover on R&D, whereas other middle-income countries spend up to 14%. In terms of R&D in India in general, we are 1 2 and 50th of USA, 1 3 and 60th of Japan, and what hurts the most, that we are 1 50th of Korea. So we don't really put any money in research and development the way we should, in case you're talking about growth and development going together. Yeah. So my point really is that what is good for business may not often be good for society, but what is really good for business and what is really good for society go hand in hand. And business people should also think along those lines, not just in terms of what their own company is doing, but what they put on the political agenda as well. Indeed, I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm on the board of Infosys, so I agree with you all the more. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I didn't know I had somebody on my right who was saying that. But anyway, what do you think is the um, uh, you know, impact of what is popularly known, uh, popularly known as crony capitalism? Because you did mention figures on transparency, international, and so forth. There's one figure I'd like to draw your attention to, and that is ever since Brazil went in a big way towards La Bolsa Familia and social uplift through these uh, measures, Brazil's uh, co corruption index went down, you know? So do you think social upliftment is one way of handling corruption? Yeah. Well, and what does business have to say about too it? Too much of business in India still depends on privileged access to some kind of natural resource, whether it's spectrum or coal or whatever. And a large part of the wealth creation that has happened and a large part of the growth has been fueled by this form of capitalism. There is the other form, which we alluded to this morning, which is more around, driven by entrepreneurship and innovation. We saw a decent wave of that, particularly in the IT industry in the late 90s. But that, that seems to have you know, slowed down a, quite a bit in recent times. So I think we have a real, real, real challenge in terms of what is the engine of uh, India's economic growth. But I think things are coming to, to the point where even those who have benefited from crony capitalism to a large extent are beginning to realize the perils of this going too far. Because if you speak to real estate developers today, all their projects are stuck, okay? And they're bleeding heavily. So at some point you realize, you know, if the whole pie is turning inedible, then well, guess what, I'm gonna starve as well. And that realization is beginning to seep in, I think, not enough, um, but, but I think we see the early signs of that. What do you think? I, I was thinking that actually there should have been another panelist who, um, you know, we have to have somebody to talk on behalf of uh, governance structures in the country because it's, it's without dispute that just the spending budgets of state governments in the last two terms of government have gone up enormously, right? And Bihar is a case that is much discussed and change is very noticeable. And the 
kind of expenditure that a state government is able to do now is 10 times than it was able to do. So there is money. And in so many other discussions at the festival, we've heard so many people from different backgrounds saying money is never the problem. Right? So, so clearly, you know, one of the things I didn't ever think that I would speak in defense of uh, growth economics, but you know, it was clearly one of the things that has happened is that there is money to be spent and that money is not being spent, which is a severe uh, logjam, and that, that, that is the real crisis. You talk to anyone in business, you talk to anyone uh, trying to do anything to start up businesses, there are no, uh, development banks have disappeared, right? All the big companies have started with funding from development banks. That whole structure of development banking needs resurgence. We need to be able to have startup angel funds for startup entrepreneurs. All those things about financial structures that need to be put into place, which have to be political decisions as much as economic decisions, that kind of political decision making seems not to be happening. In which case, uh, this is a question that both of you would like to answer, as uh, I hope. In which case, what do you think of the government's insistence that 2% be spent on CSR? Is that making up for lost time, or is it just trying to cover up something ugly in the corporate sector? Well, it's a really good question. I don't know if everybody is aware that from April 1 this year, there is the, the new act as part of the Companies Act that uh, um, people have to put aside 2% of their uh, net profit before tax for CSR, or else they have to explain why they didn't spend it. So as April 1 is drawing closer, everybody was, you know, uh, is getting, uh, getting to realize this is not going to go away, and there is this obligation. Now, there's this real question, should this have been legislated? Okay, because no other country in the world is CSR legislated. It, te it, it tends to be something that you do from the heart. And when, it's, when you require compliance, you tend not to do things from the heart, and therefore there's a there's a lot of uh, loopholes that people will look at. I worry about this for two reasons. One is when you add the 2% up, it ends up being somewhere between 20,000, 30,000 crores a year. India's NGO sector does not have the capacity and the capability to productively absorb 20,000 crores every year. So a lot of it is going to get misspent. On the other hand, you've also got many companies and, uh, you know, which are going to say, what all could I classify as CSR? and minimize my obligation. Notwithstanding that, a lot of money will go towards the social sector, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, because I think there are many, many causes which are you know, completely uh, underfunded. One of them, for instance, is uh, governance. If you're an uh, NGO focusing on, improve, on good governance, there's no funding for it. So I think there are lots of sectors within uh, which are quite starved. Another one would be human rights and trafficking. So I think the fact that there's more money is good. I, my advice to companies is don't think of this as one more gun held to the head. If you say, hey, listen, how do I make this actually a vehicle for people development? That means I'm going to take these CSR projects and I'm going to throw my best and brightest young leaders and I use 2% to actually fund those projects. It becomes a vehicle for growing next generation leaders. If you think about the fact that, you know, working at the bottom of the pyramid can actually be a source of innovation, as some medical and healthcare companies are finding, you could see some percentage of this going as R&D, if you will, business model R&D. So overall, I'm saying, you know, it's not the best way to approach CSR, but now that it's here, put it to good use, and I think uh, uh, India can show the way potentially. This business of is it being done from the heart reminds me of a, of a great lecture that Mohammed Yunus uh, from Bangladesh gave at uh, the LSE. And always, lots of people come to hear him. Students love him because he's so inspirational. He actually has a positive message, unlike the three of us who are all about doom and gloom. But um, he, when he wrote this book, Social Business, uh, he had a very simple argument, and some of you may be familiar with it, that actually businesses and people working, after all, these are people at the end of the day. Corporations are full of people. People in corporations quite like the fact that there is some aspect of their work that is not about generating profit for shareholders. Ultimately, that's, what, uh, uh, that's the logic 
of the system. And a lot of people actually quite welcomed the idea that th this was one part of Adidas or whatever that was going to create shoes for a dollar for every street child in Bangladesh who didn't have a pair of shoes. And the fact that Adidas was not going to make any money. And it's very interesting the way even our regional politics works, that then talking to Mohammed Yunus and saying, have you had conversations? So he's talking to the big global companies all over the world, in Europe and North America, the New York mayor wants him to come and do um, social businesses with uh, uh, depressed inner city groups, and, and uh, people in Glasgow want him to do with fourth generation um, uh, welfare seekers, etc. in the corporate world in India would have a conversation enough to actually explore the possibility of doing a similar sort of thing. This was his narrative. You, you may have well, a look at the story. Is CSR the same thing as philanthropy? No, and not a social business according to him. And this is not an advocacy for social business, so much to say that they, at the heart of it, they have the same reason, that you do some, there's something that you take from the profits that you make through the normal system and put it into a use where you're not trying to create profit, which is what social responsibility really is about. And where do you invest it? And can you create a business model? So it's not just about taking 20 crores and giving it to the third sector that doesn't have capacity to uh, absorb it. Of course they don't. And you know, God forbid we do that. Yeah. That's not the way to proceed. Yeah. But we need to take that 20 crores and create yeah. business models Correct. with it. We need to put it where it can be utilized. Yeah, CSR spending therefore is not just cutting a check. Yeah, that's nor is it philanthropy and yeah, I think nor that's is it, nor is it herring off. And it's me. about skilling. Yeah. Right? This is what all businesses in India are now talking about. It's corporate social responsibility is about creating skills, which we need skills and to reskill people who've lost their skills. There's a lot of de-skilling going on as well. Yep. I'd like to sort of ask her, turn the question to both of you actually, if I may. How do we begin to produce the change, right? Because yesterday I believe you had a session between yourselves around the, and I missed that. And a few good friends. Sorry? And a few good friends <laughs> about uh, the role of the so-called citizen elite, if I've got it correctly. Because a lot of these problems are known, okay? We all experience these problems in different ways. The shoe pinches at most of us. The solution, contours of a solution are also quite broadly discussed. But ultimately, nothing changes unless you have action. So, you know, my own personal interest is really not in discussing either the problems or the solutions, but what will cause the system to tip in a more positive direction. And, you well, know, well, right now, the, the, the real issue is, at this point in time, is what kind of action can be take in terms of resolving the issues of growth and development. And the reason why we're thinking about it is because, as I think Mukulika mentioned in the very beginning, that all the promises that we made until about 2008 or so, we can't quite live up to them now. And one of the reasons for all of that, and we don't want to look it in the face, and that is this, that India was doing well when the rest of the world was doing well. We were all doing well. So what was so special about India? And India's not doing well when other countries are not doing well either. So uh, if we have to really be the cutting edge of everything, then we must do something differently. Okay, now CSR is on the agenda. Now CSR is not just philanthropy, is not checkbook philanthropy, nor is it about you know, just dashing off places and digging a well or starting a school. The CSR is putting the A team to work. You know, the company's mm -hmm. A team to work, not just C, D, and E team to work, as usually the case. Correct. You put an A team to work, then your CSR becomes an integral part of your business. Correct. So it yeah. is not about you know doing something good in general, but doing something good for your business, which then radiates out into the world. In which case, projects that you mentioned, like those of good governance or trafficking in women, which company would think that a worthwhile CSR, unless you say in the CSR's philanthropy and CSR is you know doing good things in general, and where you don't put your A team to work. Right? That would be something that the social... Uh, yeah. Can, can I give you an example of this? Where uh, I learned this recently about, I mean, you know, this is a positive story for a change. An Indian company long before CSR that has a monopoly over making pumps, right? Kirloskars. They did this very interesting experience where they were finding they wanted to bring more women into the manufacturing workforce. And they set up a, a unit, a manufacturing unit to uh, manufacture pumps in Tamil Nadu, everybody in that unit, from top management to the cleaners, everybody 
people on the, on the factory floor were all women. And they did this as an experiment to empower women. When they started looking at the productivity of this particular hmm. unit, do you know what the ratio was? They usually make a pump a minute in other factories. Here they were making them in 20 seconds. So something was working, but you know, it wasn't just the fact that women were working with other women and were being managed by other women, but there were all these little things that you needed to lower the level of the workbench, that women needed more protein than carbohydrates, that sometimes nobody, so they were given threptin biscuits in their breaks, that there were sometimes they needed a footstool or they needed a break at, you know, at different intervals to others and so on. And these little tweaks, they didn't take a lot, but these little tweaks increased their own productivity three times. Yeah. I mean, that's a phenomenal, that's the kind of thinking, I think that when you're saying that this is not about philanthropy, you want to make money, you want to make three times the number of pumps that, you, that they are making, do that, but do it in a way that brings into play a certain skilling and an empowerment in a group that wouldn't otherwise. Well, I, think I, think, I think you have a few examples in your book about social entrepreneurs, you know, and how they were able to solve some social problems through frugal innovation. Yeah. No, I've become more and more sort of excited by uh, the promise that you can solve difficult business problems, uh, sorry, difficult social problems with a for-profit uh, model. So, in fact, I've set up a fund with a couple of people. It's called United Seed Fund, and we invest in, uh, in these early stage social entrepreneurs. And we've made about 10 investments in the last year, and they're fantastic. These, they're usually young people because the best ideas somehow tend to come disproportionately from people who are 25 to 35 years old. So uh, this, this gentleman goes out from the uh, hospitality industry and started a company called Jack on Block. And what does it do? If anybody's tried to hire a plumber or electrician or carpenter in any major city, you'll know what I'm talking about, how hard it is to get someone. So what they do is they employ these kinds of people, give them much higher than market rates, and you enter into contract with this company, and they're doing quite well in Bangalore, okay? The similarly, uh, you know, a, a, a startup that provides vocational skills of different sorts. I, 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 you also see this now in the healthcare industry. Arvind Eye Hospital was the first one to do cataract surgeries at 100 the cost of a normal hospital. Then Dr. Devi Shetty has mimicked that, and now in Bangalore, he started this cardiac unit called Narayan Vidyalaya, which does uh, uh, heart, opera, heart surgeries with, uh, at just one-tenth the cost of what would cost at a Fortis or some, some place like that. So more and more, I like the idea of solving difficult so social problems, whether it's drinking water, healthcare, primary, secondary education, by charging small amounts of money to create a sustainable model. But even more important than that is the idea that how can we turn around society? After all, you know, and that's why I liked your books so much. Uh, I had no idea I was going to be on stage with you. But, you know, this idea that how did India be get into such a messy uh, rut, if you will? Because if you don't understand that, you're not going to get out of it. And I think some significant part of that is uh, because educated, middle-class, urban people, much like us, have withdrawn more and more and more from society. After all, the government schools are no good, so why not send your kids to private school? No electricity, no problem. Generator set, okay? The government hospital is terrible, fine. We'll go to a uh, private hospital. And gradually you withdraw. So the question, and when you leave a vacuum, other people fill the vacuum and we don't like what we have got. So if we're going to reclaim society, how do we go about it? And that's where I like so much the idea about the citizen elite. And not necessarily elite in terms of wealth, but people with great vision and, and passion for the country going out there and going into public institutions, going into politics and tipping the balance towards good. And so the question is, can you catalyze this or do we have to simply sit down and pray and hope for the next Gandhiji to show up? So that's the question. Well, yes, uh, thank you. I think um, years ago, in 1906, uh, Jamshedji Tata, the old man Tata, invited uh, Sydney and Beatrice Webb to, uh, to his company and asked them to advise him. And they looked around and said, 
why don't you start the eight hour working day? And that's how the eight hour working day came to India, well before it came to UK, and at least three decades before it came to India as, as law. And did Tata lose money? No, he didn't. He made more money than before. So uh, my, my real question is that can business be the cutting edge for society? Is it possible for our businesses here in our country to be the cutting edge or should they just ride on social, social uh, prosperity or can they be the creators of it? Well, I have a point of view again. Um, I tried a little experiment after leaving Microsoft, right? I got worried about all these things and I said, what do we do? So we started an organization in Bangalore about two years ago called Social Venture Partners. I went around talking to people who were successful. These are not billionaires or hundreds of um, crores or any such thing. Just quite successful people in their 50s, 40s, who've done much better than they ever expected to, thanks to the last decade. And I said, listen, man, this is the kind of country we're going to be. Don't you care? And so out of this, we formed about 100 people came together. And what we do is pool our philanthropic giving together, OK? And we you know, get engaged with organizations in Bangalore that are doing good work. For instance, in Bangalore, I don't know if you know, the garbage doesn't get removed from the streets. Okay, so everywhere you go, in the Garden City, which is supposed to be like Silicon Valley, you have huge mounds of stinking garbage and rats. This has gone on now for three years. So we you know, decided to support an NGO that has sued the government and now working with the government to try and put in place the systems to, uh, to get rid of garbage. So we fund them, but more importantly, people give their time, roll up their sleeves and help the scale. So what we're trying to do is get people engaged in the communities in which they live. Having done that in their personal time, they go back to the workplace and suddenly they have a very different perspective about their role as CEO, their role as business leaders, what their company should be doing beyond just making profits and so forth. This has now become a movement. After Bangalore, now we've started up in Mumbai and Pune. And Pune starts on 1st April. And so we have a dream now. Can we be in 20 or 30 cities in the next three or four years? In each city, can we bring together lots of people like you and I and, and create a platform to get engaged in society? So this is, this is, I think this is just one example. In Bangalore, again, there's one more uh, thing that's going on. A bunch of very successful IT executives decided, hey, we can't continue like this. So they formed something called Bangalore Political Action Committee. What did they do? They fund good candidates for the, uh, um, you know, to, for the legislative assembly or the corporation, etc. So they're beginning to actually underwrite the campaigns to get better quality of people into politics and administration. Will this work? I don't know. But I think the more we encourage such experiments, the more likely we are to find the formula that yeah. will eventually help. Good, good candidates is a very good idea. But good candidates and bad parties is a very bad idea. So we must make sure we have good parties to actually see the support those good candidates, otherwise a waste of time. Now, uh, and the last question for you, Vakulika. Uh, what do you think when, uh, when people go to vote, the ordinary voter? Is the voter thinking long term or is the voter thinking short term? And if the voter is thinking short term, especially as most of them are very, very poor, then can political parties fob them off with growth stories and hold back the stories of development? I don't think any politician in their right mind, and I've, I've met many politicians and followed them on their campaign trail, any uh, politician will try and sell the growth story as uh, an election winning message. They wouldn't, they may mention it as one of, you know, when they stand up and, and for about half an hour they'll tell you what all the good things have done. And they may mention it. But they know, anyone who's close to the ground knows that it is a meaningless statistic. It doesn't mean anything. At the end of the day, you can talk what you want about your role in the globe stage, where you are in the rankings of growth rates, what is China, what is India. People don't care. When you, the short termism, as you said, if you don't have access to uh, toilets, if you don't have clean drinking water, you're not really bothered about that. But one tends to think, that poverty makes you short-sighted. And certainly, again, when I look at the 15-year period in my 
village in West Bengal. I'll tell you, when I first started, paddy cultivation was uh, very successful in this part of Bengal, both because of land reforms and because of the introduction of high yielding varieties of crops. So when you drove to where my research village is located, every side there were green paddy fields. And slowly over the years, the number of paddy fields being cultivated has dwindled. Now, even when paddy was growing well and people were making money out of paddy cultivation, they were aware that this was short-lived short because they knew that the water table was dropping because high yielding varieties uh, are very thirsty crops and there wasn't enough, you needed irrigation and they were using diesel to extract the water and that water was going to disappear. So water, I think, I mean, water, really, we cannot stress it enough, wars are going to be fought over water. We heard this earlier in the morning, we've heard it in so many places. This is going to be what really worries people all the time, all over the country. But even, my point is that you would think that being poor doesn't allow you to think about the larger picture, to think in the long term. But then when paddy cultivate, you, so people were aware this was short-lived. They knew they were making hay while there was water, but the, the, it was not going to last forever. In turn, when paddy cultivation and the lack of reform of agricultural markets by the communists, which was their biggest failure in so many ways for rural West Bengal, meant that they weren't getting a decent price for paddy and the lack of water, people just stopped growing paddy. Mm. And what did they start doing? The three main sources of income, which we should be writing about a lot more, Sand mining, brick making for bricks, right? Brick kilns everywhere. So sand mining and, and the huge attendant uh, mafia around it. What were my people in the village doing? Build, making bricks. They were growing um, cuscus, you know, um, poppy seed cultivation, poppies, uh, because uh, poppy seeds extract a very good price. And they were pilfering coal from train carriages. And this was short-termism, they had to put food on the table. But when I spoke to them, and because they trust me now, after all these years, they said to me, they said, Didi, what is this? You know, the three main ways of our income now, each of them is illegal in this country. We don't want to do it, but we do it because there's no other way you can earn a living. So we need to be investing in the industry. Look at, look at this, the whole stretch between Shantaniketan and our village, 50 kilometers, there is no industry at all. So the incapacity to think long-term just because you're poor and illiterate is simply not true. It's, I'm just reinforcing that. Well, now it's, uh, you have something to say very quickly. Yeah, I just, a question I just, just, so. Sorry, I just want to make one point without uh, eating into the question thing. You know, we've talked a lot about CSR and particularly now, Kalika, uh, you talked about toilets. I, I think 60% of Indians defecate in the open, uh, or some such number, 60 or 65%, and this is 70 years after independence. So clearly we've got to do something about the toilet and sanitary, uh, sanitation issues. And there are companies out there, including Infosys, who are going out there building toilets. We've talked businesses can't just focus on their self-interest, they have to think broadly, we need to do CSR, both personal. But at some point, we've got to make government work, okay? This is a fundamental job of government. Delivering primary education, as you said, is a, is a job of government. Delivering health care to everyone, universal health care, is a job of government. And if you always turn to the private sector to either deliver it or to CSR to be the band-aid and don't address the core issue of making government fun services function, I think we're delaying the inevitable. So more and more and more. So it would be a good idea then if CII and, if, and FICI were to put this on the table as well. I think it's so. It's not just about, about business, but that business would do well, the government as well. Indeed. And okay. indeed, that we need the two to go hand in hand. I couldn't agree more. Okay, now it's time for Q&A. Um, we have 10 minutes or so, and again, as usual, short questions. Make sure your questions are shorter than the answers. Um, for you. Is the mic? Where's the mic? I've been asked to stand up because I'm not tall enough sitting. Um, this is about capacity and CSR. You talked about the capacity of NGOs to absorb money. And in CSR, you're talking about the Microsofts and the Infosys. What worries me is a company with a turnover of 200 crores, a profit of 10 crores, now obliged to spend 20 lakhs on CSR. It doesn't have the capacity, and that 20 lakhs expenditure is not enough to pay for even one executive to put their minds to CSR. 
There's something very wrong with the scaling of this whole thing. Okay. The next question there, the, the girl on the, yeah. No, the one behind the back. Yeah. No. Uh, sir, uh, Mr. Venkateshan, you had mentioned about uh, development and the fact that a large chunk of society has been uh, pulled out of abject poverty. Now, whose idea of development must we consider between, uh, say, JSW and uh, Vedanta's idea of development and um, the idea shared by, say, the tribes of Chhattisgarh who are being displaced to give uh, space for projects by the former? Okay, one more question. Um, Lady Red Shaw, and then we can have both of you answer. Um, the second one is also addressed to you, by the way. Yeah. Um, I don't think the growth versus development question has ever been whether we should have growth or whether we should have development. It has always been whether what should come first, whether growth should come first Chicken or development should come first. So, Ravi, what do you think should come first? From what I could gather, you're saying growth should come first? Okay. I think we can start. Uh, Ravi, can you begin? Then, then we'll have Mukul. So, I'll start with the question from the gentleman there which is for smaller and mid-sized companies, can, is the CSR thing onerous? And because they also don't have the capacity. I think it is harder when you're smaller. But I think if you use even the slightest imagination, there's a way out of it. So I went to a small company in Jamshedpur, which would come under the, uh, you know, the, the New Companies Act requirement. And they're not waiting for it. What they've done is set up a, you know, they, this is a manufacturing um, company and they have a huge shortage of welders, okay? So all they've done is started a school for welders. And they take some of them, but many choose to go elsewhere. The, and so just for, there is no company I know that cannot get a huge return by investing in just skills development or organizations that are doing relevant skills development. So I think if you use, if you don't just do checkbook philanthropy and write the check for 20 lakhs, as you say, but think imaginatively about what your business needs that is also good for society and people. There are, easy, there are some easy solutions that uh, come. When it comes to what kind of uh, growth and development do we want, and the examples were given of JSW and Vedanta, I think we all talked about it. There are two types of uh, capitalism. One is the oligarchic capitalism or crony capitalism, which is all about unfair access to you know, to resources of some form or the other. And the other one is the true entrepreneurial and innovation driven. I think clearly in our, <coughs> our country needs that, not the oligarchic capitalism. But that comes back to the governance deficit, the lack of law, uh, you know, a judicial system that delivers good justice. Not one of the people who were implicated in the 2G scam today are at the heart. They're all out whether they were the ministers or the businessmen paying the bribes or the babus implicated in it, every one of them is out. So if you don't fix that, that judicial system, you're never going to get at it. But I think there was, there's, let there be, uh, there's no insinuation here in supporting the JSW Vedanta type. And then growth first or development first. I don't, again, my point is this. It, it's about, embracing a model where these two go hand in hand. It is not chicken or the egg first, okay? This is back to my quality analogy, okay? That the way you break out of these kinds of false dichotomies is coming up with a model which actually achieves both growth, economic growth, GDP growth, in, in income growth, as well as the, the, the uh, as development outcomes. And the way you do that is a combination of sensible policies and more importantly, institutions that work, okay? Our institutions have become rather frayed, which is why the development agenda is not happening even where you're pouring in money. For instance, the Maharashtra irrigation scam, 10,000 crores spent, 1% improvement in irrigation capacity. So even where money is being poured into development, the outcome is not there. So I think we need to fix those uh, leakages. I think Mokulipa will have a lot of examples from West Bengal on this issue. Of, of, of uh, well, I mean, the specific question about extractive uh, industries, you know, it, it really, at some point, I think we have to also bite the bullet and say, there are certain situations in which it has to be a political decision to prioritize one thing over the other. 
So whose development at the end of the day is a political question. Are you going to plumb as a government, are you going to support the company that wants to develop and grow and increase its profit or are you going to prioritize the people whose land it is? And that has to be a political question. You can't, it's great if corporate companies feel a sense of social responsibility, but it is, it cannot be guaranteed that they will have it. Yeah. You cannot guarantee they will have a social conscience. But when we elect political leaders into power, it's not just about the failure of the judicial system. What has been appalling in the last 10 years is that the government itself has abetted the selling out of the rights of of uh, citizens yeah. to the corporate interests. That is what, and you know, one thing that, sorry, just to finish that thought, one discourse, we talked about non-aligned movements at some point in, in one of our many discussions, but one uh, model, which is completely, which we don't talk about anymore, was India said we were non-aligned politically, but we were also going to talk about mixed economies, right? This idea that you can have uh, uh, some sort of regulation of companies so that you can keep a political conscience that delivers to the greatest demographic of people in this country. That is a political responsibility that needs to be fulfilled. And we've forgotten that. The gentleman in the back, the gray sweater. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I have a question. During the uh, discussion, two points were raised uh, by both the panelists. One point was raised that business and society has to grow together. Business and society has to go together. The second point just made right now, that growth and development has to go again simultaneously. What I disagree is you have to, to uh, the main growth in the long term comes from allocation of resources, how efficiently anybody allocates resources. Now you have got two models, capitalism and socialism. Capital, capitalism is maximization of resources and allocation of resources through innovation, whereas socialism is distributing them equally. What my question is, if growth comes, even through the oligarchy methods, what we're discussing about, like big corporates making the money, if we have the right systems in place, it okay. will trickle down. Is so the only option we have is capitalism. Socialism is never an option. For example, the Tata Nano case in West Bengal is clearly where you cannot take the land. So basically, a thing about allocation of resources. So correct yeah, capitalism is the only yeah. answer, profit model. The lady at the back in, in, in black there. there. Is it black or is it blue? What is it? I'm back. Confirmed yeah, it's black. black. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, Sir, despite everything that was mentioned about how bleak it is in India, can't hear you. Despite all the statistics, we'd say that it's bleak. India is a bleak option for young businesses, for startups. What would be your collective advice to entrepreneurs and Indians like me who still want to start a business? One, two. Um, as development and growth, as we've discussed today, has touched upon government, governance, health, water, primarily. Um, I'm working on a model to preserve the intangible heritage of India, so am I wasting my time? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, since we are talking about growth... We can't hear you. Uh, since we are talking about growth with development... Just hold it really close to your mouth. Uh, since we are talking about growth with development, since India is trying to relax its FDI policies, uh, to ease business in India, how is that going to affect the grassroots level in India? Because that's growth before development. Okay. Now you have two minutes each to respond to these questions. I don't have any. I mean, we'll yeah, have please, to go. He, it's, you must it's have really something that you could also. Uh, okay. Well, to the lady who asked about uh, advice to an entrepreneur, the, the advice I have is if you have any entrepreneurial instinct or desire in you, pursue it. The best day to start is today. When you reach the ripe age of 50 like me and you, you look back, you don't want to have regrets saying, I wish I had started something when I was 30. So don't waste any time. That would be my most important uh, advice. Your question is on FDI. <clears throat> and, you know, there's no question about it. You know, a country, any country needs, um, you know, at the India stage of development does need FDI. Uh, and it's not just investment. Multinational companies, good ones, bring technology, they bring management methods, they create jobs, etc. Now the problem is, should you have unfettered access to the Indian market? 
The answer is probably not. And even though I've, all my life I've worked for large multinational companies, I tend to be in Mukulika's camp, which is, I think, India with all its many challenges, high literacy, and, you know, all kinds of voids, we need to figure out a model of the economic that makes sense for us. And that's probably what you're calling mixed uh, economy. So I would say, yes, we should have a welcome mat out for, for uh, foreign companies, but have you know, checks and balances in place. For instance, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, you can't just turn the market over to Western um, pharma companies, or else the cost of uh, essential life-saving drugs will go completely berserk. So you have to have price controls and patent regimes which make sense and have the right balance between their profit needs and our social compulsions. And that's why you need good judgment. There's no uh, substitute for good judgment. Good. The last word, Mughalika. Um, about the allocation of, of resources issue, again, we've talked about um, the importance of governance in this. And at the end of the day, it is a list of priorities that you need to um, see uh, you know, whether what you've been trying has been working or not. The Pratham uh, report on education that was released in Delhi two days ago, you know, you've got to take on education, what is it that is going wrong? We, we, there is a certain kind of political thinking that thinks that public institutions should be supported. Is that, is the investing in bricks and mortar and more school teachers the way to further education? Or can we use technology in ways that furthers knowledge centers and creates a different kind of knowledge economy which hasn't been tried? So that kind of creativity, there's a certain fossilization that happens when, when we come out right or left, you know, like with the FDI issue, which has divided people so severely. And at the end of the day, whether it is the FDI issue or whether it is drawing up a priority list of, of where the resources should be invested, it's not to go back to our fallback position, but to think at the end of the day, who is the greatest number likely to uh, benefit from this particular measure or not? If it is by benefiting a minority over a majority, clearly something is wrong. Well, thank you very much. It's time to go to the next session. Thank you, Ravi. Thank, thank you, Mokhtar. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mukulika Banaji, Ravi Venkateshan, and Dipanka Gupta for sharing your thoughts on the paradoxes of growth and development. This session was presented by Vodafone. We will continue at five in half an hour with the next session on storytelling around the globe. And the authors will be available for book signing just over there in the venue for book signing.